As a child, I used to look up at the sky and wonder. I wondered why it was blue, or sometimes grey, or sometimes a whole gamut of colours in between. I wondered why there were so many shapes in the clouds, and how they moved sometimes so quickly across the sky, whilst I was still. When I look at John Constable's study of clouds in the Ashmolean Museum, it reminds me of holidays to the potteries in Stoke-on-Trent, and how I used to take photographs of the sky, sometimes through the trees. I wanted to capture the change in sky, to hold just a fleeting moment in my hand. When I returned to school, we had to write about our summer holidays. When the other children talked about their trip to Disneyland or making sandcastles in Spain, I only wanted to talk about the sky and to show my photographs. I think the teacher and my classmates thought I was a little bit weird. Now when I look at this painting, it reminds me of the sense of wonder I felt when lying on my back in a field, maybe in the Midlands, thinking about the grandeur and enormity of the world and my place in it. It signifies freedom and creativity to me and the ability to constantly grow. The sky seems to have no boundaries and is ever-changing, as am I. Today my own research is centred on NASA and the arts, but I feel that my point of view is changing. The intricacies of political arguments seem irrelevant when you think of the fragile beauty of our natural world. So often we go about our daily business looking down at the ground and never think to raise our eyes to the sky and wonder. When was the last time you simply stood outside in the rain and stopped everything to look up at the heavens? Hello there, I'm Dr Karen Heath, a lecturer at Lady Margaret Hall, University of Oxford, and today I'm going to consider three topics. The artist John Constable, the emotion known as wonder, and NASA's art programme. Now John Constable was born in 1776 in Suffolk, England, and he died in 1837 in London. He is perhaps one of the most beloved painters of the English countryside, notably of Essex and of Suffolk, or what is commonly termed Constable Country. During his skying period in the early 1820s, Constable spent much of his time making sketches of clouds. He observed their shape, their form and their colour, but much more than that. His 1822 study of clouds is an oil and paper and is 48 centimetres high by 59 centimetres wide. This landscape, or more appropriately cloudscape, depicts little puffy white and greying clouds against a creamy bluish sky. Painting on plein air or outdoors became very popular in the early 19th century. Constable was drawn to the study of nature and he enjoyed making quick oil sketches, particularly of clouds. He was fastidious in his method and he liked to note the time and date on the verso or reverse of the sketch, frequently with comments about the weather, including wind speed, direction, angle and type of cloud. This study is labelled 31 September, 10 to 11 o'clock, morning, looking eastward, a gentle wind to east. Of course, September has 30 days, not 31 I hear you say, but Constable often overran the month and using historical meteorological data sets, it's possible to correct this date to the 1st of October 1822. The sketch was undertaken on Hampstead Heath in London, where Constable often walked because he lived close nearby. Whilst the study of clouds is not alone then, in that he painted over a hundred different skies there, the Ashmolean's piece is unique. Indeed, every cloud scene is different, and that it captures a fluid moment in time, or at least the essence of a moment, its emotional resonance. The emotions that we might surmise Constable felt on making his cloudscapes are difficult to pin down. Wonder is most likely one key one, but perhaps also transient, fleeting emotions. What we do know is that although the gallery is carefully monitored and controlled for light, temperature and relative humidity, when we stand and closely study a study of clouds, we feel at one with nature. Looking at Constable's clouds, it's possible to tell the coming weather through close observation. I feel a tingle on the back of my neck and the hint of dampness in the quintessentially late summer, early autumn painting. It is a physical, bodily sensation, as well as a visceral emotional experience to stand in front of this painting in a deserted gallery late in the afternoon, just before closing time. Would I prefer an app on my phone or to look at this greyish, whitish, bluish, darkling Hampstead Heath sky to learn that there is a certain percentage chance of rain? Or might I forecast just from this scene that an umbrella would be a good idea when I go outside? Not just in the English 
just in case of rain scenario, but because the likelihood is that a little light drizzle or mizzle is on the way. Constable's clouds definitely aren't thunder clouds. They look like cumulus, humulus instead. Therefore, rain is not a certainty, but it just might happen. His emphasis is as much on light and transitoriness as it is upon weather, and one might never be certain of that in this country. Now, Constable believed in wonder, for he understood that nature was a revelation of God's divine will, but he was also a proponent of the scientific method. You might ask how those two sets of beliefs sat together so comfortably in Constable's mind. Suffice to say, Constable wanted to scientifically understand how clouds were formed, and this actually resonated very well with his faith, to result in emotional, edifying experiences for his audiences. Constable considered painting an experimental science, and he was well aware of cloud classification schemes, such as that of Luke Howard, who gave us the names of the three principal categories of clouds, cumulus, stratus and cirrus. In a lecture that predated C.P. Snow's famous 1959 one on the two cultures, Constable argued that the conjoining of art and science might make the sum greater than each of its individual parts. In his first lecture to the Royal Institution in London in 1836, Constable said, I hope to show that ours, i.e. painting, is a regularly taught profession, that it is scientific as well as poetic, that imagination alone never did and never can produce works that are to stand by a comparison with realities. Whilst Constable's view of science was quite different from our own, in that he considered science to be any systematic body of knowledge, Constable was seriously interested in the processes behind cloud formation, and he attempted to capture their essence, both as scientifically and as artistically as possible. And so at once, we have wandered over from the Ashmolean to Hampstead Heath with John Constable, and ruminated a little on wonder, and the wondrous relationship between the arts and the sciences and emotion. But I want to take us across the pond now, into to NASA's little known art programme, as a perfect fusion of all three. When we think of NASA, we probably think of the July 1969 Apollo 11 moon landings and see in our mind's eye a television screen with Neil Armstrong taking that one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. But just as Constable's clouds capture the wonder of the weather more fully and experientially than a photographic lens, NASA's art programme does so too, in that it was born of a desire to record the emotional intensity of the agency's space activities. NASA's art programme was initiated in 1962, and it was run by James Dean, not that one, another one, and Harewood Lester Cook. Together they commissioned greats of American art, ranging from the realist works of Norman Rockwell to the abstract of Robert Rauschenberg, right up to the performance art of Laurie Anderson. Both Dean and Cook were artists themselves, and they understood that to encourage the creative process, it was vital that artists were invited to wander, to go behind the scenes of rocketry, to meet the astronauts, scientists, engineers and others, to talk to them and to get to know them. In other words, to find a common emotional language and point of contact. The artists were granted considerable freedom of movement and the emphasis was on creativity and not being told what or how to paint. For as Dean once put it, at the core, both art and space exploration search for a meaning to life. All of this meant that artists were on hand to serve witness to highly emotional human events from the elation at the success of the Apollo 11 moon landing to the period of national mourning that surrounded the loss of the Challenger space shuttle in 1986. There was a brief hiatus in the 1970s, but the programme still persists today. With paintbrush in hand, artists capture NASA's human achievements and basically humanise its most scientific and technical federal agencies. De facto, NASA artists capture emotions and record them for posterity, for the history books. We have come a long way today from Constable's Clouds to NASA's art programme. There is much work still to do and other places and spaces to explore. As a historian, I see the same threads of emotion inextricably linking art and science together, particularly in terms of humanity's desire to reach out and fully understand the heavens. And as I look at Constable's study of clouds, I think both backwards and forwards in time, of the wonder that cloud watching brings to my life, of the beauty of our natural world, and of our shared place in it. Thank you for listening.